Jenny McCarthy Show. Oh, oh my God, Craig. The worst story that you told that has happened to you, which was <laughs> about you thinking it was a good idea to host comedy in between a punk rock band. Oh, oh. <laughs> I was in bed oh. howling at the, just the thought of it. <laughs> It was bad. It was bad. Uh, that, that's that's how I started, though. And it's like because I was a drummer in punk rock bands, and they used to say, you know, yeah, go go up in between the bands and do some jokes. You're funny, and um, it, it, I, apparently I wasn't that funny. <laughs> <laughs> People throwing bottles and cans at you. Yeah. You know, I I went to um I don't know it was something like Aerosmith, and a bunch of celebrities came like. Brad Pitt was sitting like in front of me. That's the closest I've ever gotten to him. But it was all these big names. And uh, David Spade thought he would go up and do comedy in oh, between oh, bands. Oh. It was so painful. And like yeah. he's an established guy. I know. You know, Lars uh, from Metallica said to me, they were going on tour and he said to me, hey, I had this idea that maybe, you know, you could come out and do some comedy because we love comedy. We love you. Come and do some comedy at the Metallica gigs. I was like, <laughs> you know, man, I, I do love the band and stuff, but I, I'm going to pass. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you just have Metallica gigs instead. Can, can you imagine? Uh, that's something you would ask your worst enemy to do. Well, maybe Lars hates me. Maybe that's what it is. <laughs> no. I figured that. <laughs> he hates my guts. Craig, I don't think anyone hates you. No, I, I I've know. always, always... Always, as you know, I'm a huge fan of yours, and I want to plug your book. I cannot wait to read it. While I was uh, waiting for you to get on here, I was ordering it on my on my uh, pre pre ordering it on my iPhone. Riding the elephant is the name of the book, you guys. A memoir of altercations, humiliations, hallucinations, and observations. I, I, I can say, what the hell is this book about? But well, I you know what? I have an idea. It, it's kind of it. it, it. I when I was doing late night, you know the way I used to do the monologue, it was kind of a personal thing. Loved you know? it. I, and and I kind of, I like I got used to that idea of telling personal stories. But some of the stories that I wanted to tell, they were either too sad or too dirty or too uh, or too profane to tell on TV. But but you know I thought that you know I I could tell these stories in a different way and. And maybe t some of them are too long to tell on TV as well. So you you can kind of you know enjoy yourself and uh, and relax into the story a little more when you're exactly. writing. Exactly. And, and you don't have to worry about sponsors, which is another no. big headache. Yeah, that's a that's a little tricky. And uh, I, it it kind of frees you up to to say what you want and and get a, people seem to have. I think when it comes to books, you're you're allowed to be a little more uh, free than you are in broadcast media of any type because people are kind of like, wait, what did you mean by that? But in books, they have to read it. So that takes too much time for most people. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I do love a good book, especially yours. And that's why I wrote a bunch of mine because I noticed that I wasn't allowed to say a lot of the things I wanted to say exactly on television. Um, and it wasn't even about anything controversial. It was just about my vagina. Well, it's, it's fairly controversial. I guess uh, if you I, saw it, you would think so. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm beginning to get very uncomfortable all of a sudden. I've known you for 20 years, and this is the first time I've gone, okay, I think I'm a little uncomfortable now. Do you I'm remember so when we met the first time? Do you remember? I do. Uh, it was lovely. You were on the Drew Carey show. Correct. You, you were such a you and Kathy, Kenny, and I went for lunch every day the week you were on, and you were such a sweetheart. I uh, thought the same thing about you. I'm like, I really love this guy. Oh, you were so great, and because we a lot of people were on that show, and they weren't so great. Uh, they're kind of mean or they're just, you know, quiet, I suppose. Yeah. But you were just fabulous. I just, I, I didn't know anything other than to be myself, much like you. And yeah. we both have a mutual friend, Susan DeBow, who's become oh, a little bit yeah. of a celebrity on my radio show, so I can bring her up. All right. I, I have her on all the time. And we talk about you from time to time saying, what an amazing human being you are. Oh, gosh. Really? That sounds like a lot to live up to. How about just, uh, he's know. harmless. <laughs> I get that. It's a lot of pressure. But you know what, Craig? Just like you said in this business, there's a lot of dicks. There's a there, lot there, of... There are. There are. There's a lot. I mean, I think we can agree that Henry Winkler is the nicest guy in the world. Ever. In show, yeah, and then everyone else kind of falls short, really, after that. Betty White's all right, but she's got an edge. <laughs> she's got an edge. I'll, I'll be honest. She does have an edge, actually. She does, I know. But I'd put you in that same wheelhouse there, Craig. Oof, I really would. Um, I do want to talk about some of the stories in your book. You bring up um, you bring up your Catholic upbringing. 
In well, it? Protestant upbringing, but it's like Close Catholicism, enough. but without the pictures. It's, you still get the <laughs> guilt, but you don't get the uh, the very camp art in the church. But you get no art at all. That's sad. Yeah. Is it is Protestants don't believe in Mother Mary or my? Uh, no, I no, wait. I think that the pro the Protestant Catholics ba- the basic difference is that Protestants believe that the biscuit represents the baby Jesus and Catholics believe that the biscuit turns into the baby Jesus during <laughs> communion. And I think that I think that's basic that's the main thrust of the argument between wow. the two. Transubstantiation, yeah. The the miracle of uh, communion is does not exist in in Protestant communion. I think I think that you what know what is. they they talk in such weird terms. When I was younger, I'm like the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. What do you mean we're going to eat the body and blood of our Lord It'd Jesus? It'd be Christ? a little scary. Yeah, it, it was very scary. Yeah, as a little I'd, girl. I uh, I think that you know when they say represents versus the uh, you know it is. I still I still have a. I mean, really, do we have to do all of this? Do you know what? Do you know what I think is interesting? I found out that the ancient Egyptians used to have a very similar ritual in pre-Christianity uh, for Osiris. This is the body of Osiris that died for you. This is the blood of Osiris that died for hmm. you. And they had it in ancient Egyptian ritual. I thought that was fascinating. It is that it, fascinating. That it predates Christianity. I want to know who's right, Craig. Oh. Who's right in the end? Ev- everybody is right. That's the problem. Everybody has got the answer. I don't know. Um, I, I just want... <laughs> I just don't want anyone to get mad at me about it. I I have I have kind of I have a belief system, I guess, but I'm not a religious person I, uh-uh. particularly. I don't I don't follow any dogma as such. Not that I mind other people following dogma. I just don't have any for myself. I agree. I think a lot of uh, uh, people, the older generation now, mm-hmm. even younger generation, have found more of kind of a spiritual belief system rather than a practicing religion. Yeah, I think practicing religion is fine as long as you put uh, good behavior in front of it. Right. So if you say, you know, like, uh, it doesn't give you an excuse to behave like a monster. No. Because you've managed to find a, a loophole in some old <laughs> parchments. That's not That's not good. But, you know, even though I don't consider myself a practicing Catholic anymore, I find myself just in case they're oh, yeah, right yeah, yeah, yeah. doing certain things. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, oh, yeah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's funny. I th- Have you ever read uh, Brideshead Revisited by uh, Evil Moore? No, I'm writing it down. All right, you, I think you'd love it. It's about uh, uh, about many things, but one of the stories is about a man who is is dying, and has returned to Catholicism after being away from it. It's very interesting. Is it? Yeah, yeah. It's a, it was a, a TV series and a movie. It's it's also about uh, two young men and their story, and you know, a sort of, it's a vague kind of homoerotic uh, subtext to it as well. It's it's really good. But they don't have like a near death experience, see God, and go, oh wow, Catholics are right, and come back. No, no, it's not like, like that. No, okay. uh, you know what? It would have, it would be much improved if it had put that in it. <laughs> that and maybe it, if it had a spaceship as well. I think <laughs> if Evelyn Wall was still around, I'd say to him, you know what? It's not bad. Bad, but I think you, you could put in a spaceship and maybe you know some some cowboys or something. You know what? They could um, c- combine start combining like have Scientology and Catholicism. <laughs> well, I think people do. I think you're allowed to do that now. You can just you know, use it like a smorgasbord. You pick from whatever religion you want, and you know, mm, and leave yeah. the rest. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Katie Holmes, I think, did try that. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I uh, no. do. You stay friends with celebrities. Some of them, uh, just like you know, I don't have a rule about you know about yes or no, but some people I'm I'm still friendly with that were frequent guests on the show. Some people I'm always happy to see, like you, but you know, uh, but you kind of you have people in your inner circle, uh, people you meet at work, just like everyone else, totally. and and people that I mean, I'm sure you're the same. You know, you're not friendly with every guest, but there's some of them you're happy to see, and some of them you're like, yeah, this guy again. <laughs> I guess it must be that movie's coming out or something. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Was there someone along your journey who surprised you the most? You know, as a guest, I think uh, th- there's a lot of people that surprise you good and bad. You know, sometimes you meet actors you think are fantastic and you go, oh, no, you just have been in good movies. Right. And, and they've been lucky enough to have very clever writers and directors make you look great exactly but then you meet people who are just uh just fantastic you know we talked about henry winkler who is clearly the nicest man in show Ever. business um 
And there are people like I met uh, Desmond Tutu, who uh, who is an Anglican, is a form of Catholicism, who I really liked. Uh, I really I, I'm kind of, but he's a very impressive man. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, I don't know. I don't miss doing the show. I I really don't. But I do occasionally think fondly of some of the people that I had a chance to run into. Um, and and can you tell me why? Just this is out of my own personal reasoning. Why why you're you don't miss it? Is it that you just felt like the last sand in the hourglass dropped? A little bit. It was more kind of like I, I didn't like. Now radio is a little different, but in television, if you're the host of one of these big shows, uh, there's about 150 people who work on the show. Between 100 and 150, and every day when you walk in. They want you to be in a good mood and right. be happy. And that's very unnatural. That's a very unnatural thing. And it, no one means any harm by it. But, they, you know, you, you find yourself in this very odd uh, position. I don't mind. I, didn't, I never minded performing the show. But actually, the business of, of everyday working in a show, which, as you know, is most of it, is uh, I, I, I really didn't like that. And I was working for a corporation which... It, it working for any corporation, however well intentioned, it requires a level of personal hypocrisy for me, which I I can't really subscribe to. You know, I I can't do Sorry, it. I love you so much, Greg. <laughs> and you. I hundred percent understand. I mean, you're right. You can get away with it a little bit more on radio. Like yes. I decided to not do my shows faking it. So when I'm crabby, I'm a dick the whole hour. Good. And I just take it on, David. I'm like, this is me. I'm crabby today, and tune in or not today i'm crabby because i can't fake it well i think that's more interesting though and it's more human and it also there's a vulnerability about it as well when you say because you can see someone struggle to not be a dick see <laughs> i think people who are really dicks don't struggle to not be dicks people who are you know if you behave a bit like a dick you're a little snappy with your kids or you're a little grumpy or something like that mm -hmm. That, and and you feel bad about it. That's that's actually okay. That's yeah. as long as you don't keep doing it. It's the people who are like, I'm great all the time. I'm like I, I don't know if I buy that. I'm not all. buying your bullshit. Yeah. Man. I want to plug the book again. Riding the elephant: A memoir of altercations, humiliations, hallucinations, hallucinations, and observations. He is one of the best storytellers I've ever heard You're too i mean kind. if you guys watch the show you guys know it but um even interviewing him the stories he've told me about like reaching rock bottom and pubs and and so on and so forth what in this book so we can sell a million of them right now Give me a good story that you're like, oh, I'm really proud of this one. You know, the one I'm proudest of is, is, in the book is kind of, it's an odd one because there is a story in the book uh, about when I was a kid um, with a bunch of other kids, we watched Princess Diana's wedding uh, way back in the 1980s. And as we were watching the wedding in a tenement block, we saw that there was a, a woman had died across the street. An old lady had died across the street and the authorities were taking her out. She died at a very old age. And we all talked about how, you know, poignant and sad that this sad old woman who had died alone in an apartment, who was going to tell her story? Who was going to, who was going to, you know, tell about her life? And, you know, we were all in bands at the time. We thought, well, we'll write songs about it or something, but we never did. And in the book, I wrote a story that I imagined. The very last story of the book is the story of this woman's life. I just oh, made it up, but I made up a life for her so that she's the most important. This old lady who died across the street, I made up a fictional life, and I, and I, and I put it as the last story of the book. That is so amazing. It, was, it felt very gratifying to do it. I kind, of, I kind of loved doing that, and I'm proud of it. You should be. I mean, that's what a lot of actors do with their own characters with backstories. They create, yes. you know, a whole life of, about their character. But to actually go and do it and put it in a book is quite amazing. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy with it. And I hope wherever that old lady is, I hope that somehow she can feel the resonance of that. Oh, what about your hallucinations? What are well, those? Well, they were mostly drug fueled, to be honest. Those uh, are the ones I'm excited about. Yeah. <laughs> hallucinations are not. I never actually experienced them in, in a in a very kind of concrete way. I mean, I couldn't I couldn't tell you really exactly what's real and what's not. That's one thing I found very uh, odd about hallucinogenic drugs. It it wasn't going oh well, there's there's a uh, a pink elephant over there. That's clearly not real. It was more kind of like 
flashes and bangs, and uh, it's an odd business. I, I never liked hallucinogens, actually. Yeah, I was one of those weird ones that did. Not that I would do it anymore. No, I don't. But oh, uh, no. the, uh, what's wrong with her? Everyone at the party staring at me, kind of feeling, I'm like, yeah. I can't do that anymore. Or the or the trails when you move your hand. And oh, all the that tracers? Just, yes, oh, totally. Sheesh, sheesh. Try driving a car with those. Uh, no, that would be illegal, and I would never do that. <laughs> I was like, sure, I can take everyone home. <laughs> I don't know how I'm alive. Um, I can't wait to finish your book, Craig Ferguson, Writing the Elephant, a memoir of altercations, humiliations, hallucinations, and observations. You guys pick up the book. He's one of the funniest, most talented, honest, amazing comedians out there. Craig, I adore you. Good luck to you. Come right back, back anytime. You, You're Thank the best. Thank you, my friend. Much love. And to you. Fonzie, you. <laughs> Even playing field, my friend. Even. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Sit on it. We'll be right back. Jenny McCarthy Show. Oh!